good afternoon, everyone. My name is Utpal Bhattacharya. I'm a professor at the finance department at HKUST. And my research is on the dark side of finance. You can see me on YouTube. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you the middle author here, Yang Wan Huang, who goes by the name Sunny Huang. So I don't know why Sunny is doing the dark side. <laughs> He's also doing the dark side. So he claims this is his first paper on the area, and it is on he uses experiments which I've never used before. So Sunny graduated from the University of Washington in 2016, two years ago. He's been with us for two years. He has a joint appointment in the Economics Department at, at IEMS, and he gives this talk, not me. So the plan is to begin now, and he speaks till 4.45 and he will allow you to interrupt him with questions if you have any questions. Then after 4.45, we'll be open to discussions and questions and we should finish by five. So they could be a spillover. So Sunny is the dark side. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, this is a joint work with uh, one of our uh, students that graduated this year and also uh, Professor Xiao Jian Zhao who will be joining uh, Manash. So, uh, yeah, financial fraud is a very uh, prominent issue in China. So when we write this paper, we are motivated by the case to, in 2015 about Fan Yang. Many of you maybe have heard of it. So that case is about uh, you know some uh, some you know platform talking about you can put the money in and get a 15% return, and uh, it costs about. Uh, 48 million loss uh, in CMI. And then when we write this paper, there are more and more cases being emerged, like the uh, E2Bow case. And also uh, in, CC, in uh, 2016, CCTV posts a list of 350 financial fraud cases, asking people to be cautious. And uh, unfortunately, this case keep emerging, keep emerging. And in 2018, uh, just uh, maybe in June, there is a large wave of collapse of P2P platform. And uh, many of them involve financial fraud. So these people, they, uh, they, are sit, they are standing beside the plane. So why is the case? Because once they take the money, they will you know, uh, take the flight and then ship the money away. So that uh, there is a, a, a title given by economists uh, talking about China's B2B platform, their business model is by taking flights. Okay, so, uh, this is uh, the original motivation that we have about the product uh, claim, and this is a Fajas original product. Uh, so it all, they all have the similar manner that the claim to have high return, number one, high return, number two, very safe, very safe, and then uh, they are also highly liquid, that is, you can claim your money out at any time. So if we have some you know, financial education, we know that these are conflicting goals, it seems like possible, but however, uh, it's very attractive to common people, especially financially uh, naive people. So uh, this is uh, given by the police department in 2016, at, uh, you know, after the list of the 350 financial fraud cases of CCTV, it just simply says that, remember, all financial fraud have the same feature, high return, okay? So uh, in, when we have some education, we know uh, high return uh, supposed to you know, associate with high risk. And uh, uh, so that's why when people go to protest about they lose money due to the P2P platform, due to Fanya, due to you know, all sorts of these cases, uh, when they go to file these things to uh, the police, the police will say something like, you guys, you deserve it, okay? So you are attracted by this 15% return, that's clearly you know, unrealistic, you're just a gambler, so many of them will go to protest, and then the police will uh, you know, be watching them, and they try to stop them from protesting. So the financial fraud not only costs uh, the, the individual to lose money, but also uh, cause social you know, uneasiness. So that's why uh, it, it called for you know, how to you know, uh, manage this market. So if we put these two statements together, uh, number one, all financial fraud should uh, be careful because of the high return. And then also, uh, the police says that you deserve it because you're seeking for the high return, and then now the risk comes, you should bear the cost. But let's ask the question of like, 
do this investor really deserve it? What do you think? Huh? They deserve it, okay. Any, you know, uh, objection? If you read some article about, you know, how these things investor describe the experience, uh, you start to say they have many reasons. Uh, they maybe are very well-educated, rational people doing that. But let me, you know, make it uh, very simple. So, if we say they deserve it, that means that we make assumption that these investors are well-informed and rational decision maker, so that let me call them gamblers, okay? So these are gamblers, they know that there are certain risks, they put the money in, there's a probability it will be lost, uh, and then there's another probability you have a high return. So if they are gambler, the gambler should not be protected, okay? They should, should not be protected from their loss if you go to Macau and put the money in and uh, whatever you lost, that's your own fault. So high return implies high risk, this is a common sense. Uh, but uh, there is another side of it. We say no, because if these investors have important behavior bias, okay, so their behavior have certain issue, okay, and uh, and then their lack of important information, that is why we have a lot of information disclosure policy in their very mature market. Uh, in stock market, you're supposed to disclose many of the things, your balance sheet, your cash flow, and if they lack of important information and they have certain behavior bias, later we will define it and then the financial fraud just decide the product to exploit it, then we say that it's worthy for the government to intervene in this market and maybe protect these investors. So there has been some study about it. First, uh, financial products are sometimes difficult to understand. So these investors, okay, if they are not very sophisticated, they may purchase the product that is inconsistent with their preference. Okay, if they can understand the product well, they can purchase the right thing. But because product is very complicated, sometimes uh, you know, people talk about mortgage plan that with many parameters, and uh, some of the plan looks better, but there was a hidden term that's hurting the investor. Then uh, if you have these cases, we, it requires certain, we call it financial literate, okay? Financial literacy to understand this product and make wise you know, uh, decision. However, uh, if you know these investor and also their lack of some basic knowledge about finance like in high risk, high return, they are unaware of this theorem that you know they, they also should not be blamed for that. And uh, uh, sometimes they are poorly informed inform about the possibility of financial fraud. So in general we say that if they are victims, some firm is doing this intentionally to exploit the investor, we should not blame the victims. Okay? So it comes to a question of are they, uh, so whether you know, to regulate, whether they deserve, it comes to the question of whether they're gambler or they're victims, okay? So, uh, about you know, financial market regulation, there is a trend of, uh, especially, uh, there's a trend of uh, free to choose, uh, that is financial market liberalization, uh, because uh, you know, the, the opposite term of liberalization is paternalism, economists all hate this term, okay? Paternalism means the government serves as a parent and then tells you that based on your preference, you save this much. So that's why we have mandatory pensions. Uh, in Hong Kong, there is also mandatory uh, funds that you have to contribute, and then in the end, they became your pension to you because they don't believe you that you can save for yourself, okay? So uh, this is a very paternal you know, practice and then as people became more liberal and they became you know, more responsible for their behavior, there are more, there's this trend of uh, liberalizing the financial market. So uh, they believe that these people, they believe that investors are responsible for their own uh, wealth management. They should supposed to choose when to spend their money, how much to save, what investment product to put in, how much, how much risk to take. So these, uh, if you believe that, it actually rely on the investor being sophisticated and they can self-protect from uh, some of the financial fraud. So you need to trust the investor can do that. Instead of serving as a parent, you let the kids to make decisions themselves. So if you don't believe the first philosophy, it says that the investors are not so sophisticated, 
they are naive. They are having certain behavioral bias. They are unaware of the risk. They cannot self-protect. Then you should regulate, okay? Uh, but there are some, at least some of the typical tool of regulation, uh, that they are more very general tools. So, for example, like interest rate ceiling in China is about 35%, so you are not allowed to offer a product for more than 35%. And uh, sometimes you are about uh, licensing and qualification. After the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the U.S. greatly reduced uh, the openness of the mortgage market and uh, only firm have certain qualification can now offer mortgage. So giving them qualification, giving them license uh, to offer financial product. You can also increase legal punishment uh, to deter people from uh, committing fraud. Uh, but there are you know, uh, drawbacks of doing this regulation because uh, from uh, classical economy, we know that all these like, you know, uh, policy are kind of distortionary, it will limit consumers' choice, limit investors' choice, because some of the product that used to be available became, now became unavailable. Uh, one of the reasons that there are so many P2P platforms being uh, in the emerging China is these firms cannot borrow money from a you know, traditional channel, so they return to the P2P platform. And if you shut down all the P2P platform, then these firms that are borrowing uh, will not have a, a channel to do. So you can limit the choice and also uh, when you have licensing and qualification, you will reduce competition, and then the firm will, the financial firm will have more market power. So there is a trade-off here. The key lies in the policymaker needs to know how you, how sophisticated are the investor. If they are sophisticated, you can allow the investor to self-protect, okay, and then let the market compete. But if they are not, then you need to be cautious about you know what kind of product is supposed to be offered to the market, all right? So how do we know whether the investors are sophisticated and how sophisticated they are? So we do uh, this thing. So we uh, get an education plan. We call it uh, eye-opening financial education program. Basically only transmit one message that says that uh, high return means high, high, high return if high, high risk, okay? So it is supposed to increase investor awareness of financial fraud. It doesn't do anything on the supply side of the firm, but on the demand side, it just reminds the investor to look at it. So we call this uh, a nudging, that is you don't limit the choice, but you try to you know, uh, change people's uh, behavior by a soft message without just limiting the choice, okay? So if the investor change the behavior after receiving a very simple education, let me show you what the education is quickly. This is the piece of paper we give them before they make a you know, financial decision, okay? So in the control group, they didn't receive this paper, but in the uh, treatment group, they received this paper, okay? That's the only treatment we did, just a piece of paper, okay? So uh, this paper basically just shows, so this is the English translation of it, so for this English speaker, it only uh, transmit one simple message, that is when the annual rate of return increases, it became more and more uh, you know, risky, okay? So that's the, the only information we transmitted. And uh, so after investors receive this piece of paper, okay, if they, we do view them change their behavior of investment, all right, they change the behavior of investment, then we can conclude that they are not very sophisticated because, okay, if they are very sophisticated, they know about how to do investment, that just a simple piece of paper shouldn't change their behavior, okay? But however, if they have you know, certain awareness of this theorem, then it will change their behavior, all right? So we, the result of our uh, experiment survey is it will significantly reduce the investor tendency to buy fortunate product. So it basically means a high return product. And uh, it will be most effective to risk averse investors if they are risk averse, they will get aware that okay, high return implies high risk, and they will be more uh, careful in investing in these projects. Uh, I, was, I will quickly go over you know the empirical result and turn to more uh, theoretical analysis. Uh, you have a question? So both treatment and controls, uh, they both were already in a program, and then you see whether they change their behavior or it's coming. Okay, so uh, we do this experiment in Shenzhen. It's a randomly selected thirty communities. 
So this is uh, the, the treatment we did. So we have a two by two design. So uh, you have one uh, you know, group of people seeing normal product, okay, decide whether to invest. And then another group of people uh, seeing the fraudulent product decide uh, you know, whether to and how much to, to invest. And uh, the two by two is like whether one of them is given uh, the education. So the, the two by two design is for getting rid of the placebo effect that when you are just giving a piece of paper, you change the behavior. We want to make sure it's the content about the paper that change people's behavior, okay? So if you are, you are normal product, you're receiving 8% return product, which is a normal rate of return in China. So then after receiving this piece of paper, you shouldn't change your behavior, okay? Or if there are some change, there should be the placebo effect or you should lose the control. And then when you receive a high return product, a fortunate product, uh, which we describe the product in a way exactly the same as Fanya, okay? And then uh, if you change your behavior, then it will be due to the content of the, uh, of the, the, the HP education program. So we also collect their, some of their uh, you know, demographic variable to see uh, different response. So uh, we find that, okay, so uh, with education, uh, their investment level, so the left-hand side bar is the, uh, the degree of how much they invest in it, which on this side means they invest more, zero means they don't invest. Uh, we do find that after you get the education at all level, it's uh, uh, with positive investment, they decrease and they choose to not invest in the similarly uh, problematic product. And then we find that it will be the risk averse people that mostly respond to it. Okay? So on the risk seeking group and risk neutral group, uh, they don't find a significant effect. Okay? So, uh, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So when they invest, they invest with their own money? Uh, we, it's okay. So let me be very precise. The experiment is only about uh, the uh, risk preference elicitation, but investment is hypothetical. Okay, so they're not putting. Yeah, that's why we call it experiment and survey. Okay, because in econ we are restricted to do experiment uh, in a way that we cannot deceive people. So that's not our method. You can do it in psychology. So it's a hypothetical question, but the treatment effects is still bad. Uh, so, because it's a, although it's a hypothetical question, the treatment effects is well. So, uh, we find that you know risk averse people respond to it, and then risk averse people, as usual in other study, it will be the mostly the elderly people and the women. Okay, so this opens actually opens a way for us to uh, think about uh, you know doing just a simple education before investment and the targeting on the risk averse group. So let me. Uh, but can I come back to? The yeah, thing? yeah. We are making a very strong policy statement about the Chinese government refugees and financial literacy programs, <laughs> based on an experiment where people are not playing with their own money, based where it's just a simple, are you going to do this or not going to do this? You're not going to say, are you going to do this forever and things like that. Do you think as a policy maker, I'm a leader? Uh, actually, the there is a this. Experiment. What I did here is only want to elicit that there is a proportion of people they are unaware of the theorem. That's the only thing I need for the following analysis. Uh, the point of uh, of the analysis is actually what is coming. Yeah. The so this is theory. Uh, yes, that's right. The main the main contribution and the, the way it was is theory. Yes. Right. So, but we need this for our justify our assumption of uh, there are unaware of that because that's that matters. So. Education program significant reduced respondents tend to invest in fortunate product. That's a summary of our survey. So it's most effective to risk averse investor. So it's possible to target investment. These days, if you invest in some of the, uh, let's say you open WeChat or Alipay, there's already a uh, way for you to invest your money. But if it's the first time you invest, you will need to do a mandatory survey, okay? So that's about to get your different risk preference. So if you can add a certain education element in there, it may also help the investor. So investor will purchase fortunate product due to their unawareness instead of preference because we cannot discourage rational risk-seeking risk, uh, risk, risk investor to uh, purchase high-return uh, high product, okay? 
So these are the uh, empirical findings that support the model. Uh, our em empirical finding in the experiment survey has also a part of financial literacy, past experience. Uh, those things we may use it in other projects, but for this project, these uh, the only uh, thing we are getting out of it is this term, okay? That is, there is a proportion investor that are unaware of the uh, financial problem, okay? This is very important. So we are going to use a set of methodology that in the field of foundational and the English organizations. So this is my field, I'm not a finance guy. So uh, the, this field is also called behavioral IO. So uh, this field deal with the problem of consumer or investor that has certain behavioral bias, okay? And then the firm is going to exploit it. Let's look at some of the examples. So in our case, it's about enforcing contingency. Enforcing contingency means that there is a possibility that when you are making the decision, you don't know, okay? So there is a possibility that your money being there will be taken away and, uh, by, the, uh, by the platform and then uh, uh, you will not get it back. But when you're making the investment, you're unaware of it. Uh, so there were many examples of people behavior bias in reality. For example, the classical example of naive investor is about add-on pricing. So uh, when in the US people buy the printer, printer is very cheap, but the oil, okay, the uh, the, car, uh, the, uh, the the uh, the things you use to print is very expensive, and in uh, car trip, yeah, thank you. In the in hotel uh, in hotel industry, uh, sometimes you have a cheap hotel fee, but there is a hidden uh, parking fee or a uh, or a certain uh, internet fee. And in banking service, you know, lots of bank make lots of money from overcharging fees, which is uh, part unaware by the investor when they open this uh, bank account. Sometimes people in financial product will intentionally make the product you know, confusing you so that the terms in the product is very complicated and then they do it intentionally to confuse people, okay? And uh, uh, we also talk about you know, uh, inferior, inferior product and also sometimes when you sign up for a phone plan or internet plan, there will be automatic renewal, you don't know about it. When you sign up for it, uh, you kind of sign an agreement, you just click it and then after one year, you forget about your rights of Know, reconsidering switching to other, you just automatically being renewed. So these kind of the thing are using consumers' behavior bias of unawareness or other things to exploit consumer. In industry organization, we studied this problem mainly uh, from these two angles. Okay, so number one, we first try to understand the key mechanism. This is about what what are the behavior bias that make firm can exploit consumer. Okay, so based on these. Uh, you know, a mechanism. We study these two questions. Number one is, can competition drive the problem away? Okay, if competition can drive the problem away, then we think that the market is okay. So normally, we feel we want to study the situation that competition cannot drive the problem away. Okay. So the second question is about policy intervention. So in policy intervention, this market is not that simple because we have a strategic player here, that's the firm. So when you implement certain policy about you know, uh, regulating certain conduct of the firm, the firm may strategically respond to it. For example, about automatic renewal in this paper, uh, the policy practice is trying to ask the firm that you have to send a one-click sign-off link when the time uh, of the uh, contract is ended, okay, and then the consumer can just click on the email and then sign off. But once you implement this policy, the firm will change the contract design, maybe making the contract longer, or you know, making the renewal month by month basis, so that consumer keep receiving this email and start to ignore it. So, if you only you know manage uh, by regulating the conduct of the firm. Uh, then you cannot, you know, avoid the firm make strategically respond and sometimes even make the case worse. So that's the uh, what you know behavior I know or boundary direction I know people like to study about. All right. So we we model financial fraud in this way. 
So a firm, a financial firm, can offer a product. Uh, it needs some outside investor and I to fund the project, uh, which may success or fail. Okay, and uh, he will offer a contract with a certain repayment. Okay, and this repayment, of course, needs to be large enough to attract investor. Investor have the uh, you know utility function like this. They can be risk averse or risk seeking or risk mutual. And the investor will accept the firm's offer if they find this is profitable based on their risk preference. So uh, this alpha okay, can take from value zero to infinity. So the larger alpha means they are more risk seeking. When the firm offers certain product, uh, the risk seeking people will always like to buy, but the risk averse people will be careful. And uh, when the firm offer a higher return, okay, then you can start to attract more and more risk averse people. So that's why we have this comparative static here. This alpha lower bar means what kind of investor will purchase. So there's a lower bar below that, the investors are risk, risk averse enough so that they don't uh, buy this product. And then the product itself with the investor with uh, their risk preference greater than alpha lower bar. So the important assumption come from here. So Financial fraud, we model it as a hidden action. So we denote it as X, and then denote X equal to zero means the firm will just behave honestly like before. It will offer a product and repay it if the project is successful, following the contract that is they will repay the investor by a small R. But the firm can do something else that is commit financial fraud. That is, it will repay an R, you know, when you get the money. Okay? So because firm is risk neutral, so when he get the money, he will still go for the investment because I assume that the best project is good enough, so he will still go for the investment. And then once he get, if the investment project goes well, he will not return the money, he will just you know, take in flight and ship the money away. So doing so, we incur cost, okay? So the cost will be loss of reputation, loss of future business, or it can be expected legal punishment, but doing so incur a cost. Some firm may have a high cost because they are Tencent and Alibaba, okay? Some firm have a low cost because they are anonymous people. So the naive investor, we will have a fraction of lambda naive investor. They are unaware that firm has this option. They only see the investment product, 15% return, good, okay, they, they, yeah, they, they invested it. They didn't notice that the firm can take the money away. And then the sophisticated investor, okay, they still cannot observe X. They don't know whether the firm is planning to run away or not, okay? But they are aware that it's a possibility. So that's the difference between them. So the sophisticated investor knows that there is a possibility that my money will not be returned, even the project is successful. But the unaware investor no, that does not know this possibility. So when firm, you know, making the decision or whether to offer a fortune product, uh, he would do choose uh, in equilibrium path. He would choose either of these two options. Number one is they will offer a normal product at some optimal rate. So and then obtain a certain uh, profit. We call it we denote it by uh, subscript n, so pi n. And then the, this uh, indicate the profit of a normal offering normal profit. So here we consider monopoly firm first. He has another choice that is he offer a fortunate product that he plan to run away and then he will offer basically the legally per permittable highest return, okay? To attract as many investors as possible, okay? Because high return attract more people. Doing so, he can only do business with those lambda proportional investors because the aware investor, the sophisticated investor, will know that this return doesn't look right. So that he will not invest in that, but the unaware investor will be uh, tricked by it. So that they will not purchase, and uh, then, but you know, you do business with small amount of people, but you do not need to repay, okay? In the first case, you do need to repay once the project is set. So he made this trade off. When will the firm commit financial fraud? That is, doing financial fraud is more profitable. So it will be characterized by a certain C threshold, okay? The cost threshold. If Doing financial fraud is costly, I don't do. If financial fraud is less costly, I do. And then this C threshold will distinguish from different firms. If you put money on the 
uh, you know, are you paying a return investment platform? You will feel that's very safe because, uh, but the rate is also uh, kind of normal. But if you put money on some uh, random P2P platform, you expect that there could be problem. And also they have a less cost of community financial fraud. And of course, investor welfare will be better in the, uh, when they get a normal product, all right? So this gives us this graph. So this graph is, uh, has something that I want to take away. So uh, this C star, which is the bar of committing financial fraud, when you have a C higher than that, okay, the cost is high enough, you don't do that, okay? You don't do financial fraud. But when you have a C that's lower than this C star, which is a threshold level, then you commit financial fraud, okay? So from a policy uh, maker perspective, he want this C star to be low or high, okay? He want this C star, okay? That's below the C star, they will commit financial fraud. So you want this C star to be low, right? So even firm with, you know, a, you know, a low cost, they will not consider doing it because don't get the cost, it's not worth it. So there is a relationship between the C star and lambda. When lambda is the proportion of uh, unaware investor or naive investor, when you reduce lambda, you can reduce C star. Okay, so this red line is that relationship. So at this region, when you have, you know, you have a C, okay, your cost below the red line, then you will come with financial fraud. And when you're above the red line, then you don't. Okay, so that's the firm's decision. So uh, when you reduce lambda, you also reduce the proportion of firm that's possible to commit financial fraud. So this shady area is decreasing. And when you can reduce the proportion of underway investor to a certain threshold, it doesn't have to be zero, it can be positive, there's still 20% of underway investor, then you can disincentivize completely that firm of committing financial fraud because once lambda is small enough, their firm will find that even I offer a fortunate product is only to a small group of people, it's not worth it. Maybe I just do the normal business, okay? So this is a reinforcing pattern. If you can educate people away from financial product, it also disincentivizes firm from offering it, okay? The next thing, also this is a, a where we confirm the, uh, the finding in the experiment that is uh, suppose we can have an education program that change the fraction of naive investor, uh, then you know we can turn some naive investor into sophisticated one. Uh, then we should see the pattern of what we find in the uh, in the in the experiment. That is, a risk averse investor we choose to not buy, and risk seeking investor we choose to. Uh, some of them we still buy, but they will reduce that amount. Okay. All right. So let's uh, talk about competition. So that's the one of the important message I need to transmit. So there are two firms. One has a low cost of committing financial fraud. The other has a high cost. Uh, why? Because some firm has some concern about reputation, concern about future business, concern about that the regulator will watch them more closely. But there are some firms, they are you know, less, being less uh, they receive less attention from the regulator, like some random PP platform. They will have First hand competition, the rate of return, that's an extreme assumption. We can allow for a more flexible one, but the main result can still uh, carry over. And each investor only purchase a uh, product from one firm. We'll find out there were three, there will be three types of equilibrium. One we call it normal product equilibrium, that is both firms will find it not worthy to offer financial product. Uh, it's better to offer normal product. The other we call it fortunate equilibrium, that is firms will offer you know, fortunate product, and both of them will do that. We think the most interesting case and a more realistic case is the separating equilibrium. That is, they will have the high reputed, high cost firm who has a good reputation to offer the normal product. So you have you know, Tencent and Alibaba. And then you also have some firm that will offer fortunate product in the market. So that's why we see both of them appear in reality. Okay, we call them separating equilibrium. So this is uh, the, uh, based on the parameter where the equilibrium will appear. So when both of them have a high cost, okay, these are the uh, cost of committing financial fraud, they will uh, reach the non, uh, normal, normal product equilibrium. If both of them have a low cost of committing financial fraud, they will have a fortunate equilibrium. 
And on this side, that's the separating equilibrium, that you have some firm offering water and whatnot, and some firm is offering normal problem. So we have, uh, yeah, yeah. So the live investors are also the separating equilibrium that Alibaba is offering a normal product. Yeah. He's so naive that he's still going to the other guy. Okay, say again. Uh, the sophisticated investor will. Yeah, the naive investor. Yeah. Uh, you mean the naive? Okay, this is uh, the naive. Okay, the naive investor because he's unaware of this action because we are talking about you are doing fraudulent or not. So they are unaware of this action. So they are only basically look at the rate of return. Yeah. So the sophisticated investor can get aware. So get aware, but there are a proportion investor that will look at the return. Alibaba is 8%, not good, I go to the 20% one. But they don't, they don't even get Alibaba, the guy with the good reputation. Yeah, but that's 20% return. Yeah, okay. So, so that's why I said having this proportion of people is very important because it gives an incentive for some firm to offer this fortune problem. So we will have which a result like this, this is one of the major takeaways we'll have, that is competition can facilitate financial flow, okay, why? Intuition is very simple, because competition will make the normal product unattractive, okay? So if, uh, you know, you have an intense competition in the market, then uh, the rate of return will be driven down if you offer a normal product, okay? So when there is a limited number of investors, and uh, more and more firms start to enter this industry and offer a normal product, it's unavoidable, the rate of return will uh, we start actually from the investor side to increase and the less profitable for the firm to offer. So some of the firm will think about how about I turn to another market that is those naive investors. So we have this result that the threshold of committing financial fraud is higher under the, com under the uh, competition cases for both type of firm. So it means that for those firm have a cost lower than this, they all want to commit financial fraud, okay? Previously, just with one firm, the threshold is here. But now the threshold is higher, and all these firms would like to commit financial fraud. So competition facilitates financial fraud. Competition cannot solve the issue. So this finding is also being documented in many empirical results in finance. So there are results about uh, you know, unethical conduct emerge after the market became more competitive. Uh, one example is when people offering credit cards they may go to those less sophisticated household, okay, maybe they are less educated, and maybe they are not financially uh, uh, not so uh, not so good, and then they will go there to offer credit card with a very high hidden fee or backloaded fee, okay, so that at the beginning, when they apply for this credit card, they don't, they are unaware of it, they are less careful, and in the end, they will be charged a lot of this hidden fee. And also in mortgage market, so when you, there is a deregulation and incentivized competition, then there is increasing supply of more complex product that is intentionally to uh, confuse people about it, and then some, invest, some uh, investor may uh, get tricked by it, okay? So uh, from the investor's perspective, uh, there is also ranking on the welfare. So from a regulator perspective, it is something that the regulator will be careful that in this kind of market, when you have the proportion of naive investor, then competition cannot solve the problem and even worsen the problem. And then in the Bounty Reference IO literature, we always like to talk about issue about information disclosure that is allowed that the firm that being honest to do something that is like educating the investor that uh, you should invest on the reputable platform do not be attracted by the 20% return, okay? So we give the high you know, cost firm, the, the, the honest firm this option, will we do so? So firm can costlessly disclose information, educating investor, uh, technically we call it unsure their choice set, but it, and it will reduce the proportion of uh, naive investor, okay? So Alibaba do this uh, you know, big, uh, let's say advertisement campaign says that all these P2P platform is untrustworthy, you should invest on my platform. It seems that these firms want to do so, okay? Because 
doing so in the current situation, the separating equilibrium, these two firms are serving two type of investor, reputable platforms serving sophisticated investor, and the less reputable platforms serve this naive investor. And if I can increase the proportion of sophisticated investor, that's good, right? Because more consumers come to me. But he do not want to overdo it, okay? So there is an incentive issue here. Because if the fraudulent product market became less profitable, then those firms, okay, previously maybe going to that naive investor market, now we start to compete for the normal product market. So if I'm a you know reputable firm, I know that if I educate the investor too much, I close off that market, then it brings me more invest more competitor in the normal product market. So that's why you restrict firms behave firms incentive to educating investors, the private incentive educating investors. So the policy implication is here. Uh, you know, suppose we think about you know, some of the policy tools we have. So uh, we, I list something here like lowering the interest rate ceiling, okay? Don't allow the firm to offer that high return product, okay? That's just uh, tricking investors. Second, increasing legal punishment of fortification, so you have to incur a higher cost of committing financial fraud, or you can do some public education program that has to deal with lambda in the first case to reduce it, okay? All these tools, uh, they, they are beneficial to investors, okay? So if we don't consider a super complicated model. Sometimes when you uh, impose issues or uh, impose a more strict interest rate ceiling, you may close off some of the market, uh, but in a certain range you can do so, okay? But there are some caveats about all the, these policies. So interest rate ceiling, it will rule out some financial product. It will cause distortion and efficiency loss because previously there may be some firm willing to borrow at a high return, now it's unavailable. And then increasing legal punishment and qualification will unavoidably reduce competition. So if we think about the number of firms is changing instead of given exogenously, then these policies have distortionary effect. And the public education program, okay, it's good, it's not discretionary, it's just helping investors to get aware. Uh, it's considered as a nudging, but they may crawl out firms' private incentive to disclose information. So in reality, you don't see, uh, you know, Tencent, Alibaba educating investors. So we design, so to design a policy to combat financial fraud, it's very important to understand the mechanism of why financial fraud product is being offered. And here we give this incentive model of when firm will offer and when don't. And uh, we dis when then we need to predict how firm will strategically respond to policy interventions. So not just managing the conduct, but in once you understand the mechanism, you can make a prediction how firm is going to respond. So we just give me two minutes. And, uh, Naively, we have this to take away. So naive investors are unaware of the possibility of financial fraud. They are victims, okay? They are not just gamblers, okay? So uh, policymakers should intervene the market in some way. So a simple eye-opening education program, a piece of paper can change their behavior. So risk-averse investor is more responsive to it. We can, it's possible to do target education once you elicit they are uh, you know, uh, with preference in the mandatory survey, you can conduct extra education. And then if we reduce the proportion of naive investor, you can also disincentivize firm from offering fraudulent product. So it has a self-reinforcing pattern, which is uh, good. But we, be, we need to be cautious that competition can increase the incentive to offer fraudulent product because normal product become less profitable and the interest rate ceiling, legal punishment, public education, these kind of policy, uh, they may not improve welfare, and especially due to firm can strategically respond to this policy. Okay, so uh, I'm done. So time for you to ask questions. Questions? I still have 10 minutes, but I have some backup slide maybe for you to enjoy.
for example, like these are uh, financial literacy tests. You can see like whether you can you know, answer it correctly. Okay, so uh, so in U.S. they can answer these questions about fifty percent uh, correctly. So among the people, fifty percent of them can answer uh, these kind of questions correctly. So uh, what is your answer here? I mean, you, you don't ask me question, I ask you question. Okay, so that's exactly. So that's about compound interest rate, right? So uh, how many of you know about compound interest rate? How many of you have no idea what you mean by compound interest rate? Okay, so, okay, so, What is the answer? Okay, good. Okay, so okay, okay, let's, let's continue. So, uh, second question. Any question for me? Okay, then try this question. Okay. So, interest rate is saving account one percent per year. Okay, but there's inflation two percent. Can you buy more or less of the money uh, of the product? That's about inflation, right? So first is about compound interest rate. Second is about inflation. So that will be three. Uh, there will be C. Okay. So because inflation is higher than interest rate, then you can buy less thing. Okay. And then third is about uh, diversification. So if you you have the fullest payment is true or more, then buying single company stock provide a safer return than a mutual fund. Okay. Mutual fund means you do some diverse, diversification. Okay. So it's supposed to be you know forced because doing the mutual fund is. Uh, kind of diversity can reduce risk. So these questions, okay, that will have to be solved. Yes. Okay, this is what people are getting in US, okay? So uh, they can correct this that they are correct. So uh, less people know about stock rates, okay? Most people know uh, compound interest rate inflation. And uh, we do it in Shenzhen, they get similar results. But I believe that if we don't do it in Shenzhen, but in other part of China, they'll get lower scores, okay? So they were very similar, okay? So this result uh, in terms of the, but the, the important thing is about these surveys. We hope, at the beginning, okay, we hope that these financial literacy can predict people's tendency of being involved in financial fraud. But turns out they don't, okay? So uh, we, we have these like financial literacy questions, whether they can answer it correctly, and uh, what's the, the chance they will be involved in financial fraud. They actually don't provide significant results, so that's a, Surprising thing you find. So that's we have to basically write the paper in another direction. More question? Yes, that's what we mean. So the simple question is yes. So uh, when in practice, when we offer the product, we uh, use the uh, exact design of the fine yang product. Okay. So uh, let's see people whether they have an interest in investing the fine yang product. So we call it fortunate product because that in reality is a fortunate product. So that's the. Uh, Rational gambler 
that go to the Ponzi game that think that I'm not the last one and uh, I can exit with a high return before the whole game collapse. Uh, so that will involve a dynamic model, okay? So and a more sophisticated assumption on you know treating investor more carefully. So uh, here we are mostly focusing on the first incentive. On the investor side, we are treating it relatively simple. Uh, so we don't have an answer for that uh, in, for this model. But what you said is true. So if there's a policy game, there will be a rational investor in the, you know, the dynamics that they enter and they do it. They are, these are gamblers, okay? You shouldn't protect them. This was very good. I learned a lot. So, but the last part is actually quite fascinating. So you have three sophisticated financial literacy questions. And the person who's got all of them wrong, right, she or he still chose the wrong product, right? It means that there's something wrong with these financial literacy questions, or there's something wrong with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So they, these are the three questions designed by uh, the Journal of Economic Research. And they did it in many countries. So that's why we propose the fourth question, okay, to you know, remind people about high risk and high return. Okay. So this is a fourth, oh, oh, this is one. This one, okay. So that's the, uh, the fourth question we propose. Add this question, add this question, this is the time we want to know it's like how the tendency of the world is running. So the reason I'm asking this question is because we're doing a study in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong regulators are actually quite smart. So they also have these questions. Their questions are not as sophisticated as yours. But once these guys answer the questions, they put them into buckets. So this guy is a high risk guy, this guy is a low risk guy. But they don't give the choice to the customer of what you want to choose. The person who's offering their products, since he said that here is the high risk or the low risk, you have to offer the products of this market. So they make sure that the Mapping is correct. Well, whereas in China, they are just allowed to buy anything they want. Yeah. So uh, in China, before you make investment, you will be uh, you will have a mandatory survey to click. In. So if you do it very uncareful, you just click too much, okay? But if you do it carefully, you will, at the end it tell you what kind of person you are, give you a categorization. But it doesn't force you to. Uh, doesn't give you doesn't restrict your choices. It uh, only just serve as a reminder. Uh, restricting choice is always dangerous. So uh, doing this require, you know, you are for sure these people is uh, unsophisticated. You want to serve as a parent uh, to save them. It's a very paternalism argument. So normally these survey or education only do in a nudging way. That is, they don't limit choice, but try to pursue away from some dangerous. So uh, the, that, that's why it, it require, we require an experiment because you have control group and treatment group. So between these two groups, uh, the only difference is the first group, that the only difference is the first group's product is different from the second group product and other dimensions they are the same. So when you see a difference between these two groups, it, may, it must be due with that difference. So that's the uh, uh, typical argument we have in the experiment uh, sometimes we don't know the exact mechanism, that is uh, sometimes even for uh, you developing a pharmacy or medicine, you don't know the exact mechanism, you just know it's effective. And uh, maybe it's due to you know, uh, a, a hidden and unknown mechanism, but as long as you have a large sample randomized, you can uh, validate the effectiveness. Any other questions? Just receive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, do you have any more specific recommendation of this? Maybe to uh, two point five or one point six. No, we have no.
no idea. So currently it's still 35 in China. So uh, the, the government haven't used this tool, uh, haven't used this tool. And uh, uh, doing this is, you need to be very careful because it will restrict the choices. So it can cause this turbulent effect. It's like we have a price sitting in the car, so you know what effect it can be done. Okay. Thank you very much, Sunny. Thank you for throwing some good lights on the dark corner.